Rust for Java developers. So in Java, to start a program, you can have any class names, and then you have a method which has to be static void main. To compile this, you do a javac that will compile the file, and that has created a dot class that now we can run with Java. We press enter, and we have hello world. In Rust here, what you have is you have a file name main.rs, which must have a function called main. You can get the command line argument with calling another function inside it. And then here we're calling a macro, which is println with a hello world. The way we build it is with cargo build that will build the debug version and it's statically link, which means only one file. So if we go to debug and then here we see our Rust demo. So now we can call it like this, target debug, Rust demo, press enter, and we have the hello world. Now, if you want to build the release version, you can do a cargo build dash dash release. And that will build a release folder here with a binary file, the same name. And so now we can call it like target release Rust demo. And we do the same thing without the debug information in the binary file. And in Rust here, usually what you do is you do a cargo run and that will build and run. Okay, so now let's do some live coding. In Java, the way you define a variable is you start with a type, short, for example, the variable name, and then you assign the value. And the way you concatenate to a string is with a plus and press save, and you have hello world, one, two, three. In Rust, the way you define a variable is you use the keyword let, the variable name, colon, the type. So here we're going to do the matching type here, which will be i16, and then the value. And the way you concatenate string with the println macro or the format macro is by passing another argument here. So we're going to pass x and the little bracket. Press save, and you have hello world, one, two, three. In Java, you have four primitive types for integers from eight bits to 64 bits, and they are all signed. There's a little exception for int and long, but they are mostly signed, meaning you have the minus and the pluses. So for example, here we can do int, which will be a 32 bit. Press save and it works exactly the same. In Rust, we have 10 primitive types from eight bits to 128 bits with a signed version and then the unsigned version. And then we have the i size and new size that are just aliases to the platform you are on. So if you're on the 64 bits platform, a u size would be a u64. So for example, here we can do i32, Press save, and it would work exactly the same. In Java, if you want to update a value, you just do x plus equal one, press save, and you have hello world, one, two, four. In Rust, if you do x plus equal one, you get an error, because by default on Rust, variables are immutable. So if you want to do that, you have to add a keyword here, which is mute for mutable. Press save, and then you have hello world, one, two, four. In Rust, you have type inference, so if the compiler can deduct the type of the value, you don't have to specify it. So for example, here, if we have x, press save, it works exactly the same. And by default, an integer number will be i32. In modern Java, it's the same things. You can use var here and press save, and it works exactly the same. And the default here for numbers, integer numbers, is int. We can have also floating numbers here. So if we do 0.9, press save, and then we have 124.9. And then by default here, that will be a 64 bits, and Java has two floating types, the 32 bits float, and the 64 bits double. In Rust, there's two types, which is F32 and F64. So by default here is going to be a F64. And here when we add, we need to make sure that we add the same type here. So we're going to do a 1.0. Press save, and then we have 124.9. In Java, everything has to belong to a class. So to create a function here, we are going to create it as a static member, for example, of the start class, public static void. And then we can move this code here. Press save, and then it works exactly the same. In Rust, function can be at the root. The way you define a function is with the keyword fn, and the convention is snake case. So when there's two words, you put an underscore. So say hello, and then we copy that in the function and then just call the function, press save, and we get our result back. 
In Java, you have two more primitive types, Boolean and SHA. So for example, here, we can create a Boolean coding equal true. And then the way you can print it is just by passing the coding. Press save, and now we have the true. In Rust, we also have the two primitive type, bool and char. So for example, here we can have let coding bool equal true. And then we print it this way. In Java, to do if else, we just do the if, and then in parentheses, we do the condition here, which will be a single value in this case. And for example, here, if we wanted to have a variable string mood, then we say if coding mood equal happy, Otherwise, mood call sad. And then here, we do the mood, press save, and we're happy. In Rust, it's very similar. The way to do if else is with the if keyword. So you do if, and you don't need to put the parentheses here. So we just do the coding, and then we have the if else like this. Now, in Rust, to do the similar thing that in Java, we're going to create a variable. And it has to be mutable, because we're going to mute it. It's going to be mood. And in Rust, we do not have new. So for now, we're going to initialize it with unknown. There's many ways of doing it. This is the simplest for now. And then here we're going to have mood, happy, mood, sad. And then here we print the mood. Press save. And everything works the same. In Rust, an if else can become an expression, meaning it can return a value. And the way you make a code block returning a value is by removing the semicolon. So here we are going to remove this assignment, remove the semicolon, and then rather to have an unknown, we're going to just have, have the if coding like this. And finally here, an assignment is always a statement. It's not an expression, so it has to have a semicolon. So I put a semicolon at the end, press save, and we have exactly the same things reformatted. And so now there's only one variable assignment here. And in fact, because we have that, mood doesn't have to be mutable anymore. So we can remove the mute, and it works exactly the same. For this specific example here, we could make Java look relatively similar to the Rust solution here with a ternary conditional operator, meaning that we could do equal coding, and then we have happy and sad. And then obviously we don't need that anymore. Press save, and we have exactly the same. So Rust doesn't have this notation here, which is called the ternary conditional operator. However, the fact that if else code block can return value really streamline the code, especially the fact that Rust has a default of immutability. These techniques can avoid to make variable mutable when they don't need to be. Okay, so let's talk about string now. So in Java, a string full name, for example, is immutable. And then we print it. And this is mostly similar to new string, John Doe. Press save. And now we have exactly the same thing. In Rust, String literal are immutable as well. So if we have let full name equal John Doe, and we print it with a macro, the bracket to place it, and we have our hello John Doe. The type of the full name is actually a static string. And it's static because it's for the length of the program, because that was a string literal. And that is immutable as well. In Java, if you want to make the string mutable, you use string builder. So here, for example, we can do a var here, new string builder, full name, append, press save. We have exactly the same. In Rust, the string struct is mutable. So the way you create a string struct is with a string struct associative method, which is like a static method, which is called from. Then the way you mutate the string object, you don't forget to make the variable mutable. And then you have full name, push str, and then the value. Press save, and you have exactly the same thing. In Java, the way you create a class is with the keyword class, the name, and then the properties. And here we're going to add another one, which is since, which is the year we made the contact. The way you create a contact is with a new contact, and for now we're going to set the property manually like that. And then we can display the information, the full name plus since, and we're going to have the C1 press save, and we have hello John Doe since 2005. In Rust, the way you create an object type is with the keyword struct, the type name, contact. So here in Rust, we use camel case for types similar to Java, and then we have our properties, full name, 
camel case. And then since we're going to do a U16. And the way you create this object is with the type name. And then similar to JavaScript here, we're going to do the full name. And we don't forget the to string because that is a static string, but the contact objects needs to own the string. And in Rust, again, the memory is managed at compile time and not at runtime. And then we have the since, and we do the 2005. Assignment are statement, not expressions. We put the semicolon, the full name, since, that will be the placeholder for since. And then we do the C1, full name, and the C1, since. Press save, and we have the same thing. Typically in Java, you will do a constructor. And the way you do a constructor is you have contact, full name, since, and then you do the assignment like that. And then the way we use that is we have the John Doe here as a since, but we need to cast it to the appropriate type. And then we press save, and it works the same. In Rust, for simple structure, you use that notation usually, because that has actually a lot of benefits. It's simple. And when you use defaults, there's a default notation, which is pretty nice to use. But for more complex struct, when you have business logic that's need to be processed before you create the object, you can create a factory or a builder. And the way you add static function or method to an object type is with the keyword implementation, MPL, type name. And here we're going to create a function from info, for example which will take the full name since. And the way in Rust that we define that a function returns a type is with the arrow notation, and then it's going to return contact. And here we can do a return contact. And because the name of the property is the same as the name of the variable, in this case, we can just use this notation similar to JavaScript. And now result to do that, we can call the from info with a double colon. We don't forget the to string because the strings need to be owned by the object contact. In Rust, the memory is managed at compile time. So this is why we need to take care of those kind of things. And then we have the 2005. And here we don't need to cast 2005 to a U16. The Rust compiler will do the right thing. Then we press save and it works the same. Quick note here, in Java, if you want to have a type being public, you will have to put it in its own file, like a contact.java. In Rust, any file, any RS file can export many types and many functions. And the way you make it public to other modules, and we're not going to talk about modules in this video, but later we'll address that, you put a public here. So you will put a pub here, and that will make this function and this type public to other modules. But here, since we're on the same module, we don't need that. In Java, the way you add a method to a class, so you could put it public if you wanted to have public, and then you do the return type, function name, and then you return the value. And then the way you call it is just by calling the method with a dot notation. Press save, and you get the same result. In Rust, the way to add a method to a struct is similar with the MPL. We can have a, another MPL block if we wanted to, but we can put it here as well. So we do a fn info. And the trick to make it a method of contact and not a static function of contact is to use the add self, which will be basically the this. And then we're going to return a string. And here we're going to use a format macro, which is similar to println, except that it doesn't print, it just return a new string. And we're going to have a placeholder for the full name. And then we display the sense. And then we use self. So there is no this. In Rust, is self dot full name self, and here we are just not going to put the semicolon at the end, and so we are not going to have the return here. So that's because it's the last statement of the code block that will do exactly as the return here in this particular case. So that is the most idiomatic way of doing a return in functions, and now we can change that by info. So same dot notation to call a method, and now we. Remove this placeholder, press save, and we have exactly the same result. By the way, here we could remove the return and the end semicolon, and it will work exactly the same here. Now both have the same strategy. Press save, and everything works the same. In Java, the way you define interface is with the interface keyword. 
and you define a function the similar way here, string. And the way you will implement this is by having the keyword implements, business card, and then you will write the function with the same signature. And then you will call it here the same way as any other method. In Rust, we have the concept of trait, which works very similar to interfaces. So you use the keyword trait, the type name, camel case as well, like Java. Then you define your function, use self as well, because that will be a method. And then the way you implement an interface or a struct is by using the EMPL keyword, business card, for contact. And now we can implement that function for contact. And here we're going to use a format macro again. We use a placeholder and we're going to use a self dot full name. And here's a self that we have here. Since we know that we have done for contact here, we're inside the for contact block, then we'll obviously use this property here of the contact. And now here, I can press card, press save, and we have hello business card. And that will be it for this episode. If you liked it, please add a like. If you have any question or comment, feel free to add a comment below. Until next time, happy coding.